Hey folks, this is Vince with Ants Gaming Addiction, and today I'm going to teach you how to play Deep Rock Galactic, the board game. Now, it's important to stress that I am not being paid to create this video. Um, this is on my own accord, on my own time, and these videos, I typically don't do how-tos very often because they're very time-consuming and take a lot of work. But a couple of you have asked, hey, can you make a video on how to play this game? I love the video game, but uh, I really want to learn how to play the board game. So I decided, you know, as an exception, let's go ahead and try this out, and if this video gets a lot of views and I get enough support, maybe I'll start making other how-to-play board game videos. But anyway, we're going to teach you how to play Deep Rock Galactic, the board game. Today I'll be using Tabletop Simulator in order to teach you this. I do have the Tabletop game. It's just easier for me to set up, clean up, and set up various scenarios with the digital side. And it's worth mentioning, if you're new to Deep Rock Galactic and you want to try it out before you buy it, Tabletop Simulator has an official mod. It is excellent. In fact, they're going to be updating it very soon to include some of that new expansion content that was in the recent Kickstarter. So just keep in mind, I'll be using Tabletop Simulator and not actual tabletop components. It will not affect how you learn this game. It's whether you play it on the digital or whether you play it on the tabletop, it's the same exact experience. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is set out your main board. As you can see, it's completely blank right now. And then you're going to find four separate decks of cards and shuffle them individually. Shuffle those decks by themselves. Those four decks are the event deck. There's a little arrow on the back of those. There's the swarm deck. There's a little creature on the back of those. There's the rock and stone deck. Well, I think that speaks for itself. And then lastly, the supply pod deck. It's right there. Shuffle each deck individually and put them into their respective spaces. The board will contain little silhouettes of where these decks should go. Along the bottom of the board is your game timer. This black cube will sort of progress time as you go. And just as a high level overview, you're going to want to try and complete your scenario before this black cube reaches all the way to the end. If it reaches all the way to the end and the dwarves have not completed their objectives, then it's game over and you lose. So this is kind of like the game's timer. Certain cards in the event deck will push this timer forward. And as a quick look ahead, you can set the game's difficulty to be a little bit harder if you want to. You start here on hazard one, you could instead start the timer on hazard two, or you can opt to start on hazards three for five if you're feeling dangerous. There are special like rules and conditions for hazards four and five that I really won't go into here, but suffice it to say, you can make the game harder if you want to. And again, as another quick look ahead, you'll note that some spaces feature this little, little cliffhead here. Whenever this timer reaches that particular space, a swarm happens and swarms are typically bad. So just make note of them for future reference. The next thing you're going to want to do is pick your mission. Obviously, mission one is going to be the easy side of the bunch. I highly recommend starting with that. You do have the ability in Deep Rock Galactic, the board game, to create random missions if you so choose to, or you can homebrew your own. I've done several. I've actually made scenarios that are easier than mission one just to ease new players into this game. And I've got a separate video on how to do that. I'm not going to get into it here. Getting back to what you're supposed to do, I highly recommend checking out Mission 1. Mission 1, it'll say right here, Saddle Up Dwarves, Recent Tectonic Activity, blah, 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 blah. Just read the little flavor text there. And then along the bottom, you'll see the objective. Collect five more kite and three Apaka Bloom. Before starting, remove the Oppressor and Praetorian cards from the Swarm deck. Very important. It makes the game a whole lot easier when they're not there. There is a mission-specific event card or set of cards in the event deck, and when those come up, you'll want to follow what this says. So something to make note of, you will be coming back to this little mission book later on as you play. And then along the top right, you'll notice some resources. You'll notice there's like five green resources there. That's the Morkite. You've got two gold and two red nitra. So there's different resources listed along the top here. You've also got your tokens that you're going to be seeing. And the way this works is you'll see a map. This is how you're supposed to set up the game for that particular mission. The game will come with a variety of different, um, I guess, map pieces. And it's your job to sort of fit them all together to make it look like this. Your board should look a little something like this when you're done. Again, as long as you're following the mission book and you're placing everything exactly where it goes, it should look like this. You're going to randomize some of these things. You'll note that in the mission log, you'll see little, looks like diamond icons. 
those are going to be where your gems go along the top. You'll note you have five more kite, two gold, two nitra on the very top row of that mission book. You're going to randomly place them in those diamond spaces that were in your mission log. Again, this is random placement. As far as the question marks, these little tokens here, you'll note that underneath the gems on the very top row, there's five tokens. It looks like there's two loot bugs and three apaca blooms. You're going to shuffle those up and put them face down and scatter them among the flares. You'll notice that there are little flares on the board here. You're going to shuffle up those five tokens and put these face down onto these flare symbols. Speaking of components, there's a lot of them. I will take you through a sampling, as many as I remember to put out here. Keep in mind that these are colored specifically for the tabletop simulator. Um, in the board game itself, most of these like miniatures and stuff will be a gray color unless you've painted them. Um, don't even ask me how to do that. <laughs> there are plenty of people on the Discord that can help you with painting your miniatures. Anyway, so this is the uh, supply pod on the left, starting on the very left, upper left. That is the supply pod. You can call that down several times during a mission, so as long as you've got enough gold or nitrate to do so, and it will supply you with ammo and health. You've got Bosco here. Bosco is for the single player game. If you are playing single player and only one dwarf, you can have Bosco tag along and do various things. There's various actions that he can perform. If you are playing single player, instead of using Bosco, you can opt to control two dwarves at a time, just keep their inventory and their health and all that separate. The blue gems are a quarks. Those are mission specific and will only come up when spe specific missions tell you to add them in. Nitra. Nitra is pretty self-explanatory. In the video game, it allows you to call the supply pod. Well, same thing here. The Nitra in this game primarily allows you to, well, I guessed it, call the supply pod. Um, gold in this game can serve as Nitra. It's unlike the video game in that regard. You can use gold to actually help summon the supply pod. A gold can be used as a nitra, but a nitra cannot be used as a gold. Gold can also be used to pay to overclock your weapon. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but that's gold. And then you've got Morkite here. Morkite, again, is mission-specific. It does nothing. It's just, it's there when the mission needs it to be, and you're aiming to collect those. The green cubes are mainly there to track creature health. As you do damage to creatures, you're going to be adding cubes to them on the board somewhere to track how many hits they've taken. This red cube here and all the other red cubes that you'll see typically have something to do with health. That's mainly there to track health, although sometimes if you mine out uh, red sugar or if, you know, if for whatever reason you're full up on health and you can't possibly get health when you're supposed to, you drop the health cubes onto the board so that someone else can pick them up later. If you have the Goo From Above expansion, the game will come with these green, clear Goo tokens. And again, this is color different because of the tabletop simulator version. Moving over to the right, uh, you've got these stalagmites. Um, my board game came with the actual miniatures. I don't know if the standard edition just comes with those. I couldn't tell you, but they typically are there just to get in your way. You can mine them out and possibly get some resources out of them. Then you've got these single tile tiles, I guess, and as you mine out walls, you add them in as a new place to walk into, and you'll see that in a little bit. Then you've got some other, like, miscellaneous tokens here. These are bomb tokens that might come into play should you throw that particular uh, consumable. You've got various status effects, like freeze, uh, web, stun, and then mission critical stuff here that may come out every now and again. There's primary ammo and there's secondary ammo here. And then there's these upgrades. Uh, you can attach upgrade tokens to weapons in this game and make them more powerful. That's what these are. There's a lot more than what you're seeing here. And then these are some of the face down question marks that I was kind of hinting at earlier. This is red sugar. By mining that, you can get some health. There's a barley ball. Barley bobs are primarily there to get rock and stone cards. As soon as you pick one up, you can turn that in and get a rock and stone card. Rock and stone cards are good. Those are like actions that you can take and you get special things for them. Um, you've got this egg. These eggs are only there for mission critical stuff. Uh, if the mission calls for it, they do call in glyphids whenever they are you know, taken, so keep that in mind. Loot bugs, they will generate resources for you whenever you mine them out. Then you've got these fossils. These fossils only come into play during a mission. They don't do anything for you except the mission requires you to collect so many. Same with these apaca blooms. The mission may call you to collect so many apaca blooms, and they're there just for that purpose. While I'm thinking about it, let's just quickly show you the different types of dice in this game. You've got the monster slash creature dice. These are for the bad guys that are trying to hurt you. There are different sides to these. You've got like a mouth, which is just basic attack. 
Then you've got an exclamation point. That does something different depending on the creature that is attacking you. And then you've got a blank side, which does nothing. You've got a loot die in orange here. Whenever you mine out something like a stalagmite or a loot bug, you're going to be rolling this die and trying to get something out of it. This is nitra, and that's gold. So depending on how well you roll, you'll get something different, although there are blanks on this die as well, so you may end up getting nothing. This is the pickaxe die over here to the right. It is used for both melee attack and for digging out things in the environment, walls, uh, you know, various gems, more kite, that kind of thing. So whenever you dig something out, you're going to roll this die, and depending on the result, you know, if you get one result, you've done one successful dig action. And this die does have a double pickaxe on it. If that happens, you get to dig out two walls instead of one. If you're attacking, you get to do two damage to the one thing that you're attacking or spread that damage to an adjacent target. So that is a thing as well. And then the rest of these dice are all for ranged weapons, and they have their own, like, elemental effect. Certain creatures, for example, are resistant to green attack dice. Some creatures are immune to yellow, some creatures are immune to blue, so there's a little bit of strategy and what dice you use for what creatures and what situations. But the weapons that you pick in this game will have different elemental effects, and the weapon will tell you how many dice to roll and how to use them. Next, you're going to pick your dwarf, or if you're playing single player and want to dual wield dwarves, pick two of them. Each dwarf has a different set of skills and different abilities, and I will quickly highlight them for you, but I'm not going to go too deep into them. There are several pages of information in the rulebook that will explain this, and I don't want to insult your intelligence by reading all of that off to you. But typically, what you're going to do is you're going to choose a dwarf, and you've got a couple of decisions to make. First of all, you do get a primary weapon. There's a grenade launcher, for example, for this engineer. You can either use that or you can use your alternative primary weapon. In this case, it's the breach cutter. You get to choose one of these two. Unfortunately, you can't like put the breach cutter on the, the, the driller or in the gunner. Like there are specific weapons for specific classes. So for example, this red background matches the red engineer here and this symbol matches this symbol up here. So a particular class is secondary, has to be used by that particular class. So you've got a decision. Do you want to use the inherent primary weapon, or do you want to use the alternate? And it's up to you. It's based on what you prefer. I, I think the, the default ones are fine if you're just starting out. Another thing that you're going to want to do is put your ammo tokens in. You're going to put five of your primary weapon tokens in here, and three of your secondary ones on the right. And you're like, well, what about these vents? I mean, there's two empty ones. Why am I not filling those up? Well, you do have something called a secondary weapon. And this is one decision that you'll have to make. A secondary weapon has two sides. There's the primary side, which is what you'll start off with. And when you flip it over, there is the overclocked side. Whenever you pay a gold as part of an action, we'll get into that later, to overclock a weapon, you're going to flip it over to the overclock side. And when you do, it will unlock these two slots. So whenever you get a secondary weapon, let's say you chose the Zukov Nuke 17 Twin SMGs, you only get three ammo to start with. And whenever you fill up your ammo in the future, you're only going to have a max ammo of three. But when you overclock it in the future, you will now be able to fill up your ammo all the way to the top. That's one of the primary benefits of overclocking in addition to making the weapon generally more powerful. You're going to choose one of these. There's a deck of secondary weapon cards. They are usable by any class. It doesn't matter. This Zukov can be used by the engineer, by the driller, by whoever you want to. So you're going to pick one of these. And if I had to make a recommendation, pick a gun that does not match the same affinity type as your primary weapon. Like the grenade launcher uses red dice. So maybe pick a weapon that doesn't use red dice. Maybe the experimental plasma igniter that uses yellow dice. Look at your fellow player dwarves. If your friend has a lot of blue and green dice, maybe pick the yellow ones. You know, to sort of coordinate, try and get a nice variety. Some weapons, like the stubby here, have status effects on them too. So you can actually stun enemies with this particular gun. I'm just going to grab this as an example and put that over here. You're also going to give yourself five health cubes along with a throwable. There's a whole deck of grenades. It's off to the side that you didn't see, but you're gonna shuffle the grenade deck and give yourself one of those grenades. 
doesn't matter which one, it's just going to be at random. And you're also going to get a Rock and Stone card. The Rock and Stone cards I showed you earlier, these are just special abilities that you can sort of pop during the game, and they usually give you some kind of benefit. It's worth mentioning that each class has, typically, some kind of unique equipment that comes along with it. The Engineer has a turret, for example, and also these platforms that they can shoot. If you've played the video game, then you'll know what the platform gun is all about. Here's a quick look at the Scout. As you can see, his primary weapon is the M1000 Classic, uses blue dice. The alternate version of that also uses blue dice. It's the Deep Core GK2 Assault Rifle. So you're going to pick one of those two. He also has some special abilities. I'm not going to get too deeply into them. One of which is the ability to throw flares, and flares allow players to re-roll dice if the flare is next to an enemy that they're shooting at, which is really cool. So, you also have a grappling hook that allows them to move over pits and creatures. They're a lot more maneuverable that way. There's also the light-footed ability, which after moving, they have the ability to do one free ranged attack or throw one of these flares. So, it's up to them. So, the scout can actually move and shoot all for one action, which is really powerful. The gunner has the powered minigun, and you can use that, or you can opt to use the Thunderhead Heavy AC. One uses green dice, the other one uses red dice. The gunner has a couple of abilities as well. A zipline launcher, just like in the video game, you can so sort of ride these zip lines across the level, and you've got some zip line tokens here along the bottom. The gunner also has this shield generator, one action to place the shield token on your space or to an adjacent space. It pretty much just safeguards you against damage when that thing is active. Last but not least, we have the Driller. The Driller can use the Flamethrower as his primary weapon, or opt instead to use the Cryo Cannon. One uses yellow dice, the other one uses green. Um, a lot of status effects here. Uh, you've got these Flame Tokens, which are related to the Flamethrower, obviously. And for the most part, they create like a firewall and prevent creatures from crossing it. A lot of crowd control with that, whereas the Cryo Cannon is just great for freezing enemies. Frozen enemies take double damage and don't activate right away whenever they're supposed to, so uh, both of those are fantastic utility weapons. Um, his abilities include ignore any resistance against pickaxing. So if you've got a creature that is resistant to pickaxe melee damage, the driller will ignore it because, well, he's just more buff that way, right? Uh, and has those really powerful drills. Um, on movement, he can just destroy a wall or stalagmite, but he ends his movement. So typically, you would pickaxe in order to break something. He can just walk into it and break something, saving you the action of, of picking and then moving, if that makes any sense. So the driller can actually just save time by walking into walls or other objects and just completely demolishing them. However, the downside is, if you do that with the driller, you typically don't get any rewards that you would get from that. If you drill, if you just walk into a stalagmite, for example, you do not get to roll the loot die. It's just, it's just completely obliterated, and there's no hope of getting anything positive out of that. When you've decided on which dwarves you like to play as, simply put them into their appropriate spaces on the drop pod. Red engineer on the red space, blue scout on the blue space, and so on. If you are playing single player and are only playing with one dwarf, you can put Bosco on an empty space next to the drop pod. So you can put that here, or you can put Bosco there. Taking a turn in this game is fairly simple. You're going to take three actions, and then draw a card from the event deck. Yeah, that's it. Three actions, and then draw a card from the event deck. Again, as a reminder, the event deck has the little arrows on it. However, the different things that you can do there are numerous things that you can do uh, for those three actions. You can move, attack, pickaxe, throw something, overclock secondary weapon, resupply, exchange supplies, assist revive, or play rock and stone cards, but that's typically a free action. When you take the move action, you can move up to three spaces unless something is slowing you down because of some kind of hazard. Uh, sometimes you may walk into goo, for example, from the goo from above expansion pack. That will slow you down. I'm not going to get too deep into that, but primarily you can move three spaces. So if I were to take the move action right now, I could go one, two, three. Now it's worth mentioning that whenever you walk adjacent to a face down question mark token, you get to reveal it for free. And that's actually good because I still have two, uh, one move left. I went one, two, and instead of going three down here, I can just go three, land on it, and pick it up. Note that I do not have to mine out the Apocabloom. There is no mine pickaxe symbol on the token itself. Certain tokens will have pickaxe symbols on them. The Apocabloom does not. When it doesn't have a pickaxe symbol on them, you just walk right on top of them, and whenever you do that, you automatically pick them up and add them to your little supply. 
There are some other restrictions to movement. Um, I'm not going to get into all of them, but I will kind of highlight most of them. For example, obviously, you can't walk into walls. This is a wall. Can't walk into a wall. That's obvious. You also cannot move through creatures, so I cannot step over this grunt. Okay. I also cannot step onto a pit. That's bad. Now, it's worth mentioning, the scout does have a grappling hook and is allowed to do that. Okay, but ignore that question mark. That's just for example purposes. The scout does have the grappling hook and can get around that whole move restriction thing, but the other dwarves are not allowed to traverse these pits. Um, you can also uh, move through other dwarves. So I could I could move through the scout. I just simply couldn't land on the space that they were occupying. I can also move through sentry guns, tunnel exits, supply pods, but I just simply can't end my my turn on them. I'd have to end land on an empty space. Attacking. Let's talk a little bit about attacking. You can spend an action point to attack. You can attack with either melee, meaning you have to be right next to the creature that you're attacking, and in which case you would roll this die. Whenever you roll a double, wow, okay. When you roll a double, you can actually split up your damage across two adjacent targets like that if you so choose to. Typically, I only roll that or that. That's just one damage. Okay. Um, you can also use your guns. You're going to spend either your primary or your secondary ammo, depending on what gun you're using, and then you're going to observe what they are and what dice you roll. For example, if the scout here were going to fire the deep core GK2 assault rifle, they would typically have the ability to roll dice. Now, you can either choose the first option, which is burst fire, in which case you roll two dice and pick one, or for two ammo cost, it's a full automatic, just roll two blue dice. Now, there's something super important before you can even think about rolling, and that's something called range and line of sight. You'll note that this has an R5 in either one of those modes. Range 5 is just five tiles, definitely in range, one, two, three, four. Now, you'll note that there's a stalagmite here, and there's something called line of sight. Line of sight at first gave me a lot of headache, but just think of it this way. If you can draw a line from any side of the hex that you're on, this is the side of a hex, any corner. You've, your hex has six corners on it, right? Because six sides, right? So any point, pick any point. And if that can draw a straight line to your enemy at any point on their hex, they can see it. So in this case, um, this scout could see this creature here. If they drew a line from right here, they could get to here without crossing the stalagmite. That would be line of sight, which is fine. Um, however, this enemy and this enemy would be a no-go. There's no way to draw a line from, say, here or here or here and reach one of these pointy ends without going through the stalagmite tile. Um, it's worth mentioning that some weapons and some like grenades, can actually be fired over obstacles. The grenade launcher, for example, that the engineer has, the primary weapon of his, he can actually shoot over obstacles. And of course, if you're going to throw a grenade, you can also lob those over obstacles as well and ignore this whole obstacle rule. As an example, let's just say that the blue scout used his overclocked experimental plasma igniter. Now, it also has a weapon, weapon upgrade on it, which allows him to roll a third yellow die. So let's just say that he picked his target, this, and then rolled three yellow dice like the card told him to. He would spend a secondary ammo and then roll these three dice. And let's just say that those were the results that he was given. Now it's time to assign hits, and you're going to assign hits to targets that you can see within your line of sight in an adjacent chain. So for example, he could do something like this. Now this double hit, unfortunately, cannot be spread to across two separate targets. That will apply to melee attacks when you roll this, this double hit. You can split the damage, but when you roll for a ranged weapon like this, that die has to be assigned to one target. So these dice can now be chained to adjacent targets. This one to that one, since apparently it's not going to stack, right? So let's just say, there we go. That one goes to this one here, and this one gets assigned down here. So that would mean that this target would take, that one wants to snap, but that one doesn't. Anyway, this one would take two damage, this one takes one damage, and this one takes zero damage. Now, I've talked an awful lot about creatures taking damage, and you're wondering, well, how much health do they have? What kind of damage do they do? There are these boards that you'll get with the board game, and there's also available here on this tabletop simulator version. The creatures will be listed here from top to bottom, 
And the top one, the top value here, that little square with the diamond in the middle, that is their health. So grunts only have one health. They take one hit, they're dead. They have a range of one when attacking, so they have to be adjacent to a target in order to actually hit it. Um, their movement is three. So whenever they move, they move a total of three spaces. As I mentioned earlier, these creature dice will have some kind of exclamation point effect that they will observe when they are rolled. In this case, um, it is no effect unless you're playing Hazard 5. Each creature has different stats. So definitely take a look at these when, <laughs> when they do come up because each one does behave a little differently. Creatures also have something called resistance. I kind of hinted at that earlier. In this situation, let's just say that the scout had used their overclocked and upgraded experimental plasma igniter on the Praetorian. Let's just say they assigned all three dice to hit the Praetorian. However, you'll note that on this creature board, the Praetorian is resistant to two of the yellow dice. So whenever you're assigning damage to the Praetorian, it's going to be four total minus two because of the resistance, and it would end up taking two damage. Keep in mind that these larger enemies like the Praetorian and the Oppressor, they are like vulnerable on their back end. So if you manage to hit them in the back, then resistance is ignored. The next action I want to talk about is mining. It's pretty simple. You pick a target and you attempt to mine it. You do not have to mine things that don't have the pickaxe symbol on them. For example, this Apocabloom right here. That has no pickaxe symbol on it, so all you need to do is walk over it in order to pick it up. But you have to actually land on it in order to pick it up. There are some tokens, like the alien egg, the loot bug, this red sugar up here. Those do have the pickaxe symbol on them, so you have to spend a mining action in order to attempt to get them. You can also use your pickaxe action to mine out walls and collect resources in the walls. You can get rid of these stalagmites here and possibly get some resources. Um, the alien egg, whenever you mine that um, successfully, you roll dice to see if you spawn glyphids. So there's a number of different things that you do with this particular mining action. If I were to mine this gold, for example, or just attempt the mining action, I would roll the die. And if I got a single result, you know, I pick, okay, I'm going to mine out this gold. You do that and then you put a single empty tile in its place and I can walk on it in the future, whatever. If I didn't get the gold and I, instead I got the uh, Morkite, I would add that to my supply and put an empty hex there. If I did attempt to mine out this and I succeeded, I would get a free gold and I would roll the loot die to see if I get anything extra. That is Nitra and the other one was gold. If you attempt to uh, and successfully mine out a stalagmite, you just simply roll the die. You're at the mercy of that. You do not get a free resource like you would with the loot bug. And I kind of already explained these other ones, but whenever you mine out something, you automatically pick it up. You automatically, you do not have to then walk over to it and pick it up. You mine it successfully, you automatically get it. Whereas things lying around on the ground, like these Apocablooms, you do have to walk over them in order to pick them up. One of the rare exceptions is this red sugar. This thing heals up to three health. If you, if you do happen to mine it out, Let's say I, I successfully mine this out by rolling this die, I rolled that, and I got, say, this thing will give you three health. If you are already at max health, any remaining health that you did not collect, red cubes will be dropped here instead, and someone else can pick them up and regain health that way. Let's talk a little bit about throwables. So if you have a grenade card and you want to lob a grenade, you could totally do that for an action if you want to. Your line of sight is only blocked by walls. Not by miniatures, not by, like, stalagmites and other creatures. Grunts will not block line of sight, the little small glyphid things, but everything else will. However, the grenade is immune to that. So the only thing that will stop a grenade is a wall. So keep that in mind. Each of these grenade cards has different, like, text on them, different ranges, different areas of effect. I'm not going to go over each one here, but one of your actions is, if you have a grenade, you could totally throw it. Another action you can perform is to overclock your secondary weapon. I pulled a sampling here, and to do that, you need to spend a gold. So you're going to spend an action and a gold that you have in your shared supply in order to overclock your secondary weapon. This will also unlock your two ammo slots on your secondary ammo side. It doesn't give you the ammo. You still have to fill up those ammo slots by resupplying at a pot. However, your maximum ammo is now increased for the secondary weapon. Different... Weapons will have different overclocked abilities. Some add a freeze effect. 
Others add just more dice in general or longer range or possibly an area of effect kind of thing. You're going to have to look at the different secondary weapons and figure them out for yourself. Do not confuse overclocking a secondary weapon with upgrading a secondary weapon. You'll note that there's only one upgrade slot here on the primary side, and that's just to put these in like this. These are upgrades that you may find as you're playing. Um, but on the secondary side, on the overclocked side, there are room for two of these upgrades. So don't confuse the term overclocking with upgrading. Another action you can take is to call down a supply pod. That takes an action as well as costs three nitra. Now you can substitute gold for nitra if you want. So you can do three nitra, you could do two nitra and a gold, two gold and nitra, three gold, whatever. Just keep in mind gold is also used to overclock your secondary weapons. So just be careful about spending too much of that gold. So again, if I pay the amount that I need, I can plop this supply pod down adjacent to me in an empty space. And then I draw a card from the supply pod deck and I give this card whatever resources it's asking for. So it's six primary ammo, three secondary ammo, and three health cubes. So I put that somewhere off to the side and I'd grab what I need to and, and put, put the ammo on here. And this is sort of like the stock of the supply pod. And there's three and then there's three health. And in the future, any dwarf can come over to this supply pod, spend an action and grab what they need from this card that again is off screen and just resupply their person. Keep in mind, you cannot go over your max limits. Another thing you can do is spend an action to freely exchange ammo, throwables, weapon upgrades, rock and stone cards with any adjacent dwarves that you want. You cannot exchange health, however. You are allowed to exchange supplies with a dwarf that's been knocked over or unconscious. Speaking of unconscious, let's get into the whole possibly down thing. There are two status effects other than standing up and fighting and rock and stoning. So it's possible that through some kind of event card, you were knocked down. Like you're just lying down. Your, your health is still good. You have enough health, but let's just say you got knocked down. Typically on your turn, you would have to spend two actions to flip yourself back up. However, if another dwarf is able to get to you before your next turn, for one action, they can pick you up. So it's better action economy for a team member to help you get back onto your feet. However, if you happen to run out of health, you become unconscious. You're not dead you're just unconscious. If you are unconscious at the start of your turn, you advance the swarm threat marker by one and you skip your turn and you do not draw an event card. I'll get into that later. Another dwarf on their turn may spend an action in order to flip you back up and you regain one health. So you will be able to move around again, but you're down to one health. Another thing you can do on your turn is play rock and stone cards. These are free. You do not have to spend an action in order to play them. These are one-off cards that you typically get for beating tougher enemies. Um, tougher enemies will tell you, draw a rock and stone card whenever you defeat me kind of thing. But anyway, these are one-off cards that when you play them, they go into a discard pile. But typically you get some kind of huge benefit. And again, they do not cost an action to play. Once a player has spent their three actions, you move on to the event phase. That's where the game is trying to kill you. You're going to draw a single card from the event deck. And I've pulled some samples over here. You would not draw this many typically. I'm just simply putting them here to show you a variety and what different ones may look like. This one, for example, says they're closing in. Increase swarm threat by one. At any point, if it says increase swarm threat by one, you're going to move this black cube up to the next space. If it happens to move onto a space that features one of these guys, then a swarm will kick in, and I'll explain that later. But you're going to finish out the current event phase first. This one says, if this did not trigger a swarm, activate all creatures. I'll get into activating creatures in a second. Another event that you might see. Um, some of these are optional. You don't have to do these. They're just there if you want it. You just read the card text and decide whether or not you want to do this. Um, they go boom. Activate all creatures. If no creatures are in play, place an exploder at exit 1. On occasion, you will be asked to spawn creatures. So if I were to grab an exploder, it wants me to put an exploder to exit one. Um, I didn't explain this at the beginning of the video, but there are going to be spawn points. And when it says to spawn a creature at, say, one, you're going to pick an adjacent spot, an adjacent open spot to that spawn point and put it down. It's your choice, really, but typically you want to 
sort of program the AI, it, it likes the closest possible target available. It will Creatures will typically target the closest dwarf. And if, if there's a tie, they'll target whoever just recently went. So spawning creatures is a thing during this event phase. Just find the number on the board and spawn those appropriate creatures next to it. Um, Mission-specific event. Like I said earlier, some cards in the event deck will say this, and that's when you need to refer to your actual mission book. On the bottom left, it says mission-specific event, glyphid uh, grunt nest. Place a grunt at each tunnel exit. So I would find the grunt mini and maybe put the grunt, I guess, here, for example, and then one by number two, which is here. Now, when the event card tells you to activate all creatures, you're going to do them in order. You're going to activate each creature in order. You're going to activate all the grunts, then all the web spitters, then all the exploders, then all the mactera spawns, and all the slashers. You're pretty much going from top to bottom on the one board, and then top to bottom on the second board. So all the smaller creatures first, and then all these harder creatures last. Whenever you activate a creature, it will attempt to attack if it can, if it is within range. So a grunt has a range of one. If a grunt is not within range one of a dwarf, it will move. And that's it. If, it, if the event says activate all creatures, it will just activate. It will either move or attack. It will prefer to attack, but if it cannot attack, it'll move to, toward the closest dwarf. So if there were no grunts next to a dwarf, they would just simply move. And again, you're going to activate each grunt one at a time, and it's your decision as to which one gets moved first. When they do attack, make note of how many dice they roll, any special effects on the dice when you roll them, that kind of thing. Some enemies like the web spitter can attack at, say, range 5. Um, however, like I said, if a web spitter is not within range 5 and has no line of sight of the enemy, or of a dwarf that it's attacking, it will instead move three spaces. There are some cards that will both activate and attack. So they will both move and attack, which is pretty nasty. But typically, you're going to do one or the other. It prioritizes attacking, and then it'll move. So what happens when the black cube reaches one of these nasty little glyphid spaces? That is when you draw these swarm cards. After the event takes place and the threat meter moves up, you'll draw one of these swarm cards. And again, I drew three of them just to show you a variety. You would only typically draw one of them unless an event told you to do otherwise. For example, this is Boom Bug. Place one exploder at exit one and three grunts at exit two. Activate all creatures. Slice and dice. Place one slasher at exit two and two grunts each at exits one and three. Activate all creatures. Web spitter. Place one web spitter at exit two and two grunts each at exits one and three. It's worth mentioning that sometimes these cards will reference an exit three. If there is no exit three on the board, ignore it. There are some tiles that are not in scenario one, but are in future scenarios that may allow a third one to show up. If that's the case, if three, if exit three does show up at some point, then of course follow this card to the letter. But if exit three is not visible, then ignore that part of it, but still spawn the enemies everywhere else they're supposed to. Just to quickly show you what an activation may look like, and again, this is just mock gameplay. I set this up really quickly. Let's just say that the event card said, activate all creatures. Again, we're going to take a look at this board. We're going to go top down. All of the grunts will activate. So we're going to activate one grunt at a time. There's a grunt up here. It is not next to anyone. It only has a range of one. So it's going to move toward the closest dwarven stop. That's it. This dwarf, or this this uh, grunt, is already next to a dwarf, so it will attack. And if we take a look at the little board on the left, it'll roll one die. On an exclamation point, it has no effect unless it's hazard five, in which case it's a damage. So we would roll one die, and it's a mouth, a creature. So that means that the attack is successful, and the engineer would lose one health on their particular board. This other grunt here is going to move... Um, it's not next to anything to kill it, so movement three, one, two, three. All right, so it's now next to this. The next creature, because there are no more grunts on the board to move, the web spitter is the next one down. Is it range five of something else, and does it have line of sight? And again, these grunts do not block line of sight, but other things do. So it can. It has line of sight here, okay? So it will just stay where it is and shoot. It rolls two dice. And... Two exclamation points. So in that case, uh, my engineer becomes webbed, which is a status effect. And I'll touch on status effects a little later if I remember to. But the engineer would receive those web tokens. 
Next, we move on to the Exploder. The Exploder has a range of one, movement of three. There's no dwarf next to it, so it's going to go one, two, three. Note that creatures can cross these pits no problem. They can also end their turn on them. They're kind of just scurrying along the walls as that as the manual implies. But that is a sample activation. You're going to activate each creature type one at a time from top to bottom on these boards. Speaking of status effects, I thought I'd just quickly show you this. Again, this is in the rulebook, so you can look at it on your own. But you have various effects like stunned and webbed and frozen. The stunned effect if on the dwarf will limit your next turn to one action, and that's it. So if you're both knocked over and stunned, you won't have enough actions to get back on your feet because standing back up by yourself is two actions. Um, if you place a stun on a creature, it just simply prevents it from being activated the next time it's supposed to activate. So if that stun token was on the web spitter, it would not have been able to shoot or move or anything. The stun token would be removed and then that's it. And then on its next turn, when it's activated, assuming it hasn't been stunned again, um, it would be able to do its normal thing. Webbed is kind of the same thing. It has no effect, though, on a creature. Being webbed, you cannot move at all until your next turn. Frozen, on the other hand, you cannot be frozen, at least with this particular base game. It is possible with the new expansion stuff that I don't want to get too much into. You can get, like, hypothermia effects and different things. But check out my, my video on that re regarding the Kickstarter expansions. Uh, being frozen is the same thing as being stunned on a creature, except the creature will receive double damage, which is kind of nice. So And resistances are not ignored, though. Just keep that in mind. But it's a good way of, like, destroying a really high health enemy. You freeze it first, and then you just 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 bomb it. Just nuke it. There are some other status effects, but like I said, I'll let you discover those on your own. And if you're curious about the weapon upgrades and what the different dice rolls possibly do, that's all laid out here for you as well. All right, so how do you win this game? Well, if you've collected everything that you're supposed to collect and your dwarves have made it back to the drop pod, you win. Pretty simple. But you can lose a number of different ways. If your dwarves are all unconscious, then that's that. If you attempt to move this uh, tracker here, this, this uh, like... I want to say round tracker, but the threat meter, if you try to move this up one more space and it's already on the last space, that's another way that you could possibly lose. Um, there is a, like a medium win condition, like partial success if the time runs out, but you know, you've completed everything and just haven't gotten to the drop pod. Um, there's more details in the back of the rule book, but primarily you're either going to run out of time or you're going to become unconscious. Those are the two primary ways to lose. And again, the only way to win, complete all of your objectives and get to the pod. And there you have it. Now I have to stress, I did not cover everything found in the rulebook. For example, when you first get on the planet with your dwarves and you leave the drop pod, your drop pod tile is supposed to be flipped over to the land side, and then it only flips back over again when all of the objectives have been completed. Little stuff like that I did not touch on because it was just kind of minute. Um, a lot of other situations may come up. How does this resolve with this? What about this warden? How does he work with himself and all these other creatures? What's the activation on this? Who moves first? Where do I put them? Um, what about this line of sight issue I'm having? I, I, is this line of sight? I can't tell. What about assigning this damage? How does that work with line of sight here? I get it. There's still a lot of stuff that I did not touch on. There's even a deep dive campaign that you can decide to play on. And there's even more stuff coming with the expansions that were recently funded on Kickstarter. They won't be available till next year on the hard copy tabletop wise, but they should be introduced to Tabletop Simulator, at least this particular module soon. I'm told November 1st, but again, subject to change. So I just want to preface and just sort of end everything by simply saying, you know, I'm not being paid to do this. This is just something I wanted to do to help out new players get acclimated to the game. I think this would be a decent high-level overview. And if you think this would help you or help some other players get into this game, then please feel free to share this video around. Like, subscribe, show me some support. And if you want to see more like videos of this, I'll be happy to do it. But I need to see the view count. I need to see the support. And I'll be happy to continue making that content if there's a demand for it. So Deep Rock Galactic, the board game, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.